Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, with William Albrecht today, and also Eric Ibarra, both Roman Catholics, and also joined by our esteemed guest, Father Christian Coppice. Father Coppice, did, did I pronounce it correctly? I've heard multiple pronunciations. Did I get it right? I'm in a world in which I uh, grew up with capes, capers, napes, napers, napies, na napis. So okay. um, you're within the ballpark, which is actually fine. Okay, excellent. Well, how would you prefer? Just to, I, if you I, could I, put I, the record for us. What I'm used to, but um, you'll rarely see me uh, correct. In fact, uh, my first name is with two A's, which is Dutch. And um, I've had a priest in my diocese for 20 years that was calling me Christian. And uh, <laughs> I never... I never corrected him. I was, I've grown up, have, I have egoism in many things, but not in my names because I never had it said right by a bank teller or anybody else. Well, I'll tell you a, a, a quick story here. I had some uh, a coworker um, for about three years called me Josh. I don't know where he got the name from. I never corrected him the first time he called me Josh. So I guess he just assumed that was my name. Mm -hmm. And I just let it go on and on and on. <laughs> so for the next three years, he called me that because I just didn't have the heart to correct yeah. him. <laughs> and I was, actually, I was actually sad with my story because eventually about after 20 years, well, 15 years, somebody told the priest that my name was Christian. Mm. Uh, that was kind of depressing. It was always entertaining to see him because I knew it was coming next. Okay. <laughs> well, Father, let me ask you about um, the topic of the Immaculate Conception. Now, I know you wrote a book here. It's titled exactly that, The Immaculate Conception. It looks like it oh, is. Oh, you got it. Yeah, I do have it. This is the first volume. I understand you're working on a second. This is published by Academy of the Immaculate. I got it on Amazon. Anybody who's interested, um, I'm going to put a link to it at the description at the bottom of the channel. Definitely check it out. But, Father, let me ask you a couple questions sure. about topics in this book. Now, you deal a lot with the term prokathartesa from uh, Greek, and I'd like for you to perhaps explain what exactly does the term mean, and how does Gregory of Nazianzus, a Greek father, use the term? Well, uh, the term itself is fairly rare. I think I track in the book that it's only used in extant sources, meaning search engines and my own patristic readings, maybe about a dozen times total. Uh, some of those times uh, are, are surprised. They're, they're getting to be more because I keep doing more work, so I've maybe added one or two. But uh, in the Greek language versus, let's say, Syriac with somebody like Ephraim the Syrian, who also understands the concept with regard to Jesus and Mary, but is using, of course, uh, a, a Semitic language to express himself. But it, so in, in Gregory's Greek language, which is late fourth century, um, it's not clear lexically what it means. It's only clear by using basically his three sources, which are his Pascha, his maybe Epiphany or Theophany homily, and um, some of his dogmatic poetry where he uses it. And he uses it uh, in reference, at least to Jesus and Mary, uh, as a pair, as a, as a duet, as a, a dyad. And when he uses it in the dyadic sense, it means something that is all pure, which has uh, graces and glory added to it. Graces meaning some form of divine activity which cannot be accounted for by nature, in which the creature, in this case rational creature, uh, is being receptive to that divine activity. And then glory uh, is oftentimes uh, associated with the miraculous. So a miracle, oftentimes associated with the biblical story, divine light, something along these lines. Uh, and Gregory, and then the entire Eastern tradition, meaning every Byzantine author that uses the term, including actually um, Islamic uh, and Quranic uh, authors, uh, when they use the term uh, in Arabic and in, in Greek dialogues of John Damascene, it always means the same thing, which is something that's already holy that is has some grace added to it. Now, in an interview that you did with William, a phone interview, I recall you saying that the term could be applied to sinners. So could you maybe explain, um, does the term necessitate the idea that a person is being purified from sin and therefore if it's applied to Mary, it would imply that she had original sin? Or are there nuances being made when the term is applied to Mary versus when it is applied to people who have actual sin? 
Uh, part of your answer just, um, and I, I, w I should have probably told you about the other book that uh, is on Amazon, which has got Father Peter Damien Fellner uh, mentioned. It's a collection of essays. In there, I have a chapter in which I trace the Procatharthesa in the West mm. and all of its uh, translations into Western patristics and councils. Um, and there, I think I begin to discuss that Nazianzen also had a use of pre-purified in the sacramental realm. So Jesus's primary designation as purified has to do with the fact that he was baptized mm -hmm. and he was purified in the temple. So, of course, theologically, we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus gets purified in the temple, does that mean he was dirty before in some way, whether morally or physically? And if he gets purified at baptism, does that mean that he is in some way um, dirty before morally or physically? And of course, we know with a high Christology that the answer must be no. Uh, as did Gregory Nazianzen in the late 4th century, that the answer for Jesus' baptism and for his Jewish ritual of being presented uh, or dedicated to God, made holy by the uh, virgin's presentation in the temple, um, that Jesus' purification sacramentally are never purifications from something that is ritually impure, uh, physically impure, meaning there's not really a, a bodily washing for any sort of hygienic purposes going on here. And then lastly, it's not because of moral impurity. So uh, basically, uh, Gregory Nazianzen then prioritizes the primary referent for the term pre uh, I'm sorry, purified, the word purified. He makes the primary reference for the word purified of Jesus at his baptism and at uh, his presentation of the temple to mean that an all holy nature is made um in some sense, more intensely uh, participative of grace and glory. And so uh, now the question might come then, well, what does this have to do with Mary? Well, he also calls her purified in his dogmatic poetry in the same sense. He'll say that Jesus was purified for my sake and that Mary was purified. Uh, but when he's talking about the incarnation, a temporal uh, prefix, pre-purified, or pro in, in Greek, simply means that Mary received her all-holy nature's purification and grace and glory prior to becoming uh, pregnant, uh, whereas Jesus never has ever the term pre-purified used for him. It's quite wrong to think that he does. Uh, it's only used for Mary, and it's only for moments of grace and glory before the Incarnation. In, the, in Gregory Nazianzen's text, it's only used for the Annunciation, but as the festal cycle of the Byzantine church, just like we have in the Western church, the conception of Mary, the birth of Mary, uh, Mary's present uh, presentation as a child in the temple, as the feasts increase, the Greek Orthodox tradition starts to use the term pre-purified also to to refer to all these events, because they're all liturgical events where grace is given to Mary. She somehow has a deeper experience of, of God's action in her uh, in that moment. And at the same time, she has uh, something glorious that happens. So we know, for example, when she's presented in the temple is that she has angels minister to her, or when, uh, she is, when she is born, there's these miraculous events that happen in the Pretty Evangelium of James. Or when she conceived, this is a miraculous event in the Pretty Evangelion James. And so all these moments are called uh, eventually by Greek Orthodox fathers. We can call them Catholic if we wish. It's, it's, it's arbitrary at this time to use either one of those designations until you probably get into the 13th and maybe even the 16th centuries. Um, uh, Orthodox or Catholic, but the Greek fathers of the church for both churches um, pretty much uh, refer to pre-purification in this way. So hopefully that's that that part is is clear right now you you say that the term is applied to mary um by gregory um 
as happening prior to pregnancy, but how much prior? Could, w- would he say that it goes back to conception? And if if not, um, no, why is no. it irrelevant? No, he's not really interested in the conception of Mary because the only feat that exists in Byzantium at the time is Mary's motherhood, which is at that time uh, within the post-festive or pre-festive days surrounding Christmas. So there's no reason to talk or apply pre-purification liturgically to a liturgical feast that doesn't even exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what he's simply stating is her nature is pure and that has great and glory. Now, you and I might want to say, well, if she has an all pure nature, when did that all pure nature start? Well, we never get a sense that it was dirty and then made pure because that's not how he uses the term of Jesus and Mary. But then there comes your sacramental question. But he does talk about pre-purification in the traditional sense of Dionysius uh, of Alexandria, using it um, from the third century in his his uh, notions of purification of body and soul sacramentally or ritually to take the bodily impure and purify them. This is, this is what Gregory does. Now he's got a basically two different applications. He has this immaculate world of Jesus and Mary where purification or and with Mary, pre-purification is equivocal. That is, when all pure natures get in touch with rituals that God gives them or sacred moments, they increase in their human experience in the mystery uh, of God, but they don't have anything to be, they're not, they're, they're gold that's already refined. They don't have to have any dross burn away. Whereas when we uh, participate in the sacraments of the church, we actually get purified because we have all kinds of dross to be burned away. So the term is used by Gregory to be equivocal. So for the prophets, Moses and John the Baptist, they are pre-purified, let's say, or, um, or purified. It depends on, on which text you're looking at. For Gregory, they're they're almost always purified, though, in the liturgical hymnody that, that stems from his theologies. Moses and John the Baptist are called pre-purified. So what a purifica- pre-purification means is they do a series of ascetical labors, fasting, prayer, uh, watching. Then there's a moment at which the Spirit uh, prepares them and uh, perfects them in baptism. So um, preparing means washing away their sins uh, by these labors um, and then perfecting them uh, presumptively with some sort of stain in their conception um, at the moment of baptism and from all their actual sins that they are in some sense still uh, needing to be uh, cleansed from. So it sounds complex, but in the Byzantine calendar, it makes a lot of sense is that w- every sacrament requires uh, every sacrament of initiation requires pre-purification every prophet before he participated in the prophetic grace of god and was himself given something the quasi experience of baptism the quasi experience of god's presence that we get in the sacred mysteries he had to be pre-purified but when jesus himself experiences the sacraments he doesn't need any dross taken away he just needs to have his humanity uh, more deeply keep experiencing temporal these graces that are the in modern orthodoxy, the divine energies of God. And um, let, let me ask two more quick questions, then I want to pass it on to Eric. Um, when would you say the first time the term pro cathartesa is applied to Mary's conception? When, when was this? The most, uh, the first time that it was explicitly, without any doubt, uh, mm-hmm. applied to her conception is with Joseph Brienius um, in the 1430s, who is the I don't want to call him teacher as a teacher to uh, pupil relationship with St. Mark of Ephesus for the, for the Orthodox, but is his elder companion and father in the faith. Mark of Ephesus wrote an entire uh, speech in honor of Joseph Brianus of Orthodoxy. So he explicitly makes that statement uh, about her Feast of the Conception in the 15th century, which is the exact same century when the Immaculate Conception becomes defined in the Latin churches. Okay. And then one more that I'm curious about. Um, when, or let me actually phrase it like this. Um, some say that, you know, the fact that we have Mary's uh, dormition being celebrated as a feast, that of course indicates that she died. So accepting that this is um, authoritative and indicative of the fact that she actually uh, died or fell asleep, does this indicate that she had original sin? Does does death necessitate um, original sin? 
or is it possible that she died without original sin? Um, I always like to torture people by making distinctions. Mm. Uh, and so here we go. Uh, if I'm a Catholic asking, I have a prepackaged definition of original sin. And the primary way in which original sin is going to be looked at is through the Council of Trent on its decree of justification. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you're going to get there is you're going to get something called, that's called an immaterial grace. And that original sin is just a privation of an immaterial grace. And immaterial things uh, don't hang around in bodies. Immaterial things that are graces are things that infuse themselves or modify or inhere in souls. So for a Catholic, when you hear something about um, original sin, um, nowadays they are obliged to be talking in the terms of a spiritual entity or a spiritual action of God in the soul, not in a body. Um, when we look at where modern orthodoxy is, they don't have a prepackaged definition of original sin. So we might want to look at the canons of Trullo, where we do hear that there is something called original sin from the Council of Carthage. We may hear that babies need to be baptized from this original sin to, for salvation, but we don't really get a definition of what its constitutive elements are. And uh, so we hear a lot about nowadays, if we were to ask a orthodox about original sin, um, is we hear a lot about the primary effect of original sin, which is, I think, quite reasonably from St. Paul, in uh, especially Romans, is death, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual for us to define things by its most... Uh, predominant characteristic. So let's let's use a universal kind of authority like John Damascene, who was used by both the Scholastics and by the um, Palamites uh, when they were in dialogue with each other. And uh, John Damascene is going to talk about a perfect definition, which I don't need to get overly into, but it's it's something that we're we can have excellent knowledge, infallible knowledge of, because it's something like defining triangles and squares and there's even one or two things in the real world that we can define, and one of those is a human being, a rational animal. But pretty much beyond rational animals, maybe some moral definitions, we can't find what is called a genus and a species and a specific difference for just about everything in our material universe. And so when it comes to can you give a definition of original sin, you can't give a perfect definition of one. Mm -hmm. uh, from a Damascene point of view and from a scholastic point of view, you can only describe, like a dictionary would, some of the principal things that either talk positively about what are the positive traits of someone with original sin, which doesn't uh, sound like, like, what are you talking about, the positive things in original sin? Well, are you still human? Do you still have a human nature? Because, I mean, that's not driven by necessarily every uh, mm -hmm. Protestant. So I can talk about its positive, the positive traits of a human that has original sin, but then I can also... Uh, talk about the privations. So the Latins uh, dogmatically have a privation. It's called a privation of original justice. So that's what makes you an original sin. That that doesn't exist in any ecumenical council or any official document of which I'm aware for the Orthodox Church. Now, I haven't looked at uh, discussions of original sin in 1648 and 1672 in the two councils of Jaffe and Jerusalem, so maybe somebody knows if there is a definition of original sin there. Yeah, but, but otherwise, uh, I would say this is that if Orthodox want to call in the for them original sin by its principal effect, yeah, they're perfectly welcome to do so because they don't have a TV dinner uh, definition of um, original sin that you just throw in the microwave and it's ready to go. Instead, they've got to prepare this thing from scratch because they're drawing from all these metaphors of the fathers, all these analogies that are being made all these exegeses of different pieces of scripture, they've got to come up with a definition that works for them. And right now it's death. So does the door mission mean, uh, does Mary dying mean that she had original sin? I think that for Orthodox, they can perfectly well say yes, because for them, there's a one-to-one -one ratio. Original sin is death. Therefore, if Mary dies, we can say she has original sin. Of course, now we have to really do some work when it comes to Christ's body, right? Mm -hmm. so, that, that's where we have to start making exceptions all over the place. Uh, so we can see that it it's just not, it, in, in and of itself, including original sin to death isn't sufficient. Now we're going to have to start qualifying it. And the question is, to what degree will an Orthodox theologian allow himself to qualify Mary as exempt? And that, that's an open question. Whereas for a Catholic, uh, it's if you look at the decree of Pius IX, 
The question is, was did Mary have a privation at her conception of original justice or its equivalent sanctifying grace uh, in the sense of making you just before God versus uh, a child of wrath uh, before God? And the answer is no. He had whatever grace was necessary in order to be a child of God at the moment of her conception, not a child of wrath. So it all really just depends on how we're defining original sin. Yeah. Uh, do we use a um, standardized definition or do we use a more free uh, attempt at giving a definition because we prefer this father, or this description over that? Excellent. Well, I have some more follow up questions, but I'm going to wait until Eric and William get some of their questions in. So, Eric, go ahead and jump in here. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me on again, Michael. Um, uh, if I didn't already say it, I really appreciate your work, uh, Father Caps. And uh, I'm asking these questions uh, with um, eager interest in picking your brain here, if you don't mind. And uh, if you're interested in, go ahead and shoot. This, I, <laughs> um, I, I teach uh, seminarians all day long, and I uh, enjoy it. So, Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, I did, I did want to point out that original sin... Uh, is used at the Council of Jerusalem in 1672. Uh -huh. um, I was able to pull it up here just now. That's why I, that's why I was able to find it. Um, but all it says is that um, those who have original sin uh, require baptism in order to have it uh, blotted out because of John 3, 5, where our Lord says, uh, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And the second time it comes up, it says uh, that uh, an effective baptism is the remission of original sin. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't really go into any definition, like you said. Yeah, well, that's a little, that's at least one more interesting item from, I think, Carthage. Uh, the guy I had to prepare myself tonight, I was actually watching you discuss, I think, uh, Eric, with a uh, Orthodox in some previous show. So it sounds like you, you're really knowledgeable of those canons. Um, so I, you, you probably can see very much that there's not much going beyond there from the canons of Carthage. What is that? 419. Um, yeah. Four, uh, I don't remember that second phrase being there. There's a remission of original sin. That feels new to me. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the big things that comes up in this debate between Catholics and, and Orthodox, especially is the idea of the development of doctrine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people look at the development of doctrine and they, they're very puzzled by it because it seems as though it's just another a card that Catholics throw down on the table when we can't connect the past to the present. And, you know, one of the, one of the ideas that was well accepted from uh, John, St. John Henry Newman's the, the essay on uh, on doctrinal development is logical logical and necessary deductions are a granted legitimate development but when things are not logically deduced uh as as of necessity but rather fitting and i'm sure you're familiar you know mm -hmm. when when sure. medieval theologians, they, they tend to use this word fitting quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is a result of more of a, a, a logical and necessary deduction of prior data? Or would you say that the Immaculate Conception is more um, the church looking into her, her tradition and what bubbles up is a fitting idea. Well, that's a really interesting way to put the question. I've never had the, the question asked that way, so it's a really good question. Um, yeah, uh, the first thing that my mind goes to is, um, again, I, I watched about two different shows that you guys had because I just wanted to get comfortable with your format. And one of the interesting thing was, is this, I, I don't know that every Orthodox feels this way, but I had the impression uh, with many of the blogospheric orthodox that uh, that my students come to me with, is that St. Vincent of Laren is a good guy in modern-day apologetics of orthodoxy. And if you actually read his um, work on uh, tradition, he talks about progress in faith as is exactly what you call it, is taking something like 
the word human and deducing the genus, the species, and the specific difference. He's, he's using basic porphyry here, basic uh, definitions that you're going to get from the organon uh, of Aristotle here, which is you find out what the generic thing is. Okay, well, man is an animal. And then you find out what the specific thing is. Well, he's a rational animal. Well, how, how, how do I call him human? Well, because he has this very peculiar thing that's irrepeatable in any other being in the world, and that's rationality. And so that gives you a perfect definition. And yet there is progress being made here because what was only kind of in a very haphazard or kind of blurry way by analysis, I come to a much deeper understanding that man really consists of two distinct realities. And then I can even talk about the relationship between those two realities, how one is not the other, and uh, come to quite a few insights about human beings once I define them as rational animal. And um, so what I'm hearing you say, John Henry Newman, doesn't surprise me because he spent so much time studying St. Vincent of Loren. So he wrote an entire work on St. Vincent of Loren. So it sounds to me like um, not knowing much about John Henry Newman is that he's basically repeating St. Vincent of Loren, which to my knowledge is a good guy for modern kind of blogospheric orthodox out there. So if that's what progress um, is, I'm all for it because I mean, Everybody seems to be for that, if we like St. Vincent of Lorraine. And how do we then look at Mary? So is Mary, um, is, is, is she of necessity because of some sort of scriptural revelation? Does some text necessarily implicate her as all immaculate? I think that there was a debate in the Western church with this regard as the material sufficiency of scripture. Um, you have uh, different parties that think that you can find everything in scripture, and then you have parties that don't believe that you can find everything in scripture. So I don't know that there's a dogmatic point of view. My own pr particular point of view is if you read Galatians, I think it's around Galatians 4.2, and you give a correct analysis of who this born under the law is, is that you're very, very close to having to say that no injustice, something like no original injustice it can be part of marriage inheritance or else she can't bear the child of promise. My, my own interpretation of Galatians 4.2 is very, very unknown. I haven't written anything on it. Um, but so I would say that there is a material sufficiency with scripture. Does that mean that she doesn't die? Because for Orthodox, the issue is, uh, is Mary exempted by death, death being in some sense an effect of original sin, and in fact, what we're going to call original sin um, I don't think that there's anything in scripture that, that makes me believe that Mary is exempt from death. Um, and then as far as then, do I actually believe that uh, the Marian doctrine is principally from fittingness? Historically, I think that John Duns Scotus, his principal drive was from fittingness, but some of his disciples actually argued for pre-purification like Francis and Mayra. Um, so I could go either way. Okay. Yeah. It, you know, what's interesting about St. Vincent of, uh, of Lorenz is that he, he actually uses, uh, I, I, and I haven't looked at the Latin, but he actually uses uh, what seems to be the word C when he talks about doctrinal development. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just reading from a, an English translation, but it, it is interesting because uh, I've read a couple of Orthodox theologians, one being um uh, Father Andrew uh, Andrew Louth or Luth, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't remember how you pronounce the last name, but mm -hmm. Louth. Louth, yeah, he's got an essay uh, in a work that's dedicated to Jaroslav Pelikan mm -hmm. on the Western. Uh, it's called, I think, it's called the Western Tradition uh, uh, Essays in tribute to uh, Jaroslav Pelikan, and the title of his essay is "Development of Doctrine: Is It a Valid Category?" For Eastern Orthodox theology, and uh, he he basically says no, it, mm. it's not a valid category for Orthodox. Um, he kind of mentions how the essence and energies Palamite doctrine and the doctrine of the veneration of images might seem to qualify for development of doctrine, but he just uh, I think he just rejects that it, it's a, a result of development. Um, and then on the opposite end, he, he, he would say that the Catholic Church is open to the development of doctrine, which makes it out to be almost like 
we the Catholic Church is more open to unfounded change, and and that's just you know I kind of if I if I ever did get into the academic world, that's probably a topic I'd aim at is trying to show what authentic development of doctrine is. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, it's just funny because Saint Vincent uses the word seed, and it's and in the like you said the Orthodox blogosphere. You got a lot of Orthodox who say, oh, you know, Catholics, they they believe in this seed to tree and acorn to make corn. You know, they, they make this, uh, they almost speak about it flippantly as if it's something that's uh, it, it's devoid in, in their tradition. Mm-hmm. But it's right there in St. Vincent de Lorenz, like St. John Henry Newman pointed out. Yeah, because St. Vincent's going to spend some time talking about how the definitional existence of man is there from the beginning of his conception as rational animal and hence even though it's not very visible because he's just kind of this blob blob the scripture call uh some scripture translates him as just a little clot of blood or something but uh but he's a rational animal there somehow and uh it takes uh, quite a bit of uh viewing of this being and it's developing and it's various features to when you finally start seeing him um, uh, do math and laugh at a joke, you can say, hey, that little blood clot is a rational animal after all. So, I mean, it takes a little while. So, um, but he's relying on uh, classical models of uh, talk about the categories and then definitions on, on, on interpretation uh, and um, uh, of Aristotle. And this is the basic inheritance of uh, Greek rhetoric that's being used in Constantinople at about this time. It culminates in these uh, rhetorical handbooks that are being used in the 500s in, in Constantinople. You can't really talk about things without a definition. So everybody understands what a perfect definition is. Everyone's aware of this. This isn't syllogistic theology. This is analysis. The genus and species can be taken from an essence of a thing. So that's all, all, all I'm saying going on here. So to me, it's not very controversial. But then again, um, I'm just some little blip on the uh, Eastern Christian screen. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I appreciate you going into the background there because even, even then, uh, it seems as though uh, sometimes we get put uh, on, in this spotlight where we, we, we just have a development of doctrine card that we want to throw down, mm-hmm. um, and um, you know, even with the analogy of the, you know, the human conception and, and the rationality that grows out of it. Um, I can almost imagine, I can almost picture in my head somebody saying that that kind of human development as an analogy runs the risk of uh, being interpreted like what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, well, when I was a child, I used to think like a child, and but now I'm a man and I think like a man as a way to sh- try and say, well, the church fathers were kind of infantile, they were immature, mm. and and now we are mature and we're adults and we get to you know think different things. And so even then with the human development, would you say that there's still a fine there are some boundaries? And I think St. Vincent provides those boundaries. Am I am I mm. correct? Yeah, basically with the way that essential definitions work is um, uh, there's only there's there's only so many limits. The, there's only so many words that you can choose to define a triangle without making it into a square or a hexagon or a circle. So you're not going to get very far when you try to square your circles. Usually that person is either used insane. They also happen to bark at moons and walk around naked at night uh, in the midst of the streets, uh, or they are an individual who is uh, trying to tell us that they've found the way to square the circle. And of course, nobody expecting this to be true since the two con- the, the two concepts are inherently irreconcilable. So well, what you end up having then is the development of doctrine. If you take the um, analysis of a essence into its constitutive parts, like a triangle or a square, then you've automatically limited yourself in development of doctrine to everything that you're saying about this reality of revelation has to be somehow founded on the very reference points of the terms themselves. You're just making them stated more clearly, or you're taking parts. So the, the obvious one is with Christology, right? So if we say in the somebody like Athanasius, if he wants to tell us using a synecdoche that, uh, that he's completely, that Jesus is completely God, and he's, but he's God that took on 
uh, human flesh, and that human flesh includes a, a soul. So he's trying to say he took on humanity. Um, it, it took several hundred years of reflection on the what the essence of humanity was. Does humanity have a will? And it's only uh, several hundred years later that it, it's seen not as something purely accidental to a human definition to be a freely willing kind of being to have that capacity, but something essential. And so what you really have here is you have things that nobody would have asserted uh, in the century, namely that uh, it's a, the essence of uh, the human being is to have something that is called the faculty or capacity of the will, because they would have been talking more in stoic terms, which are a little bit more ambiguous, um, or neoplatonic terms, which are a little bit more ambiguous, ambiguous of self-movement and what is up to us. And then all of a sudden you see this perfection of, of, of language of the human will by Augustine and then uh, and Maximus who's potentially influenced by him. And then you know, all of a sudden you see that we, by analysis of what humanity implies by its very intrinsic necessity of its terms, is that we have to define that Jesus has a human will, not just a divine one, and then it becomes dogma. That to me looks just like Vincent of Lerin. It looks just like uh, my understanding as, as poor as it is of Newman. And uh, that's how I would at least frame um, the discussion of the development of doctrine. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds like what you're saying here, Father, is exactly what St. John Henry Newman said when he, when he said, ideas have consequences. And when, when an idea is unpacked and developed and dissected, it's not an idea being added to with other things that are foreign. It's the idea becoming more of itself. Yeah, and the viewer, right? Yeah, yeah. That's I, 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 I'm a, I come from an Anglican background, so Newman was, uh, he was very influential, but I don't quite know the, um, the, you know, the, the Greek, the, the Eastern theology, like you're bringing out here, which sounds like it's very complementary and not contradictory. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, Basically, with Latins that are doing any sort of thought in this regard in the fourth and fifth centuries are using these a, these kind of uh, kind of messy uh, Latin translations of uh, Greek basic logic that's going on, including including Augustine himself. So they're they're, they're relying on these logical handbooks that are basically uh, commenting on um, the basic corpus of Aristotelian logic, and um, so it's it's no surprise that Vincent's aware of this. Augustine's aware of this. Um, but uh, you, you have to spend some time in the sources for it to just feel like it's obvious where it's coming from. Yeah. I just have one more quick question here. Mm -hmm. um, being a former Anglican, uh, I, I still read a, a, a quite a bit of Anglo-Catholic material. And um, there's a, a book that was edited by uh, an old late Anglican. He's passed now, Eric Moscow. Um, and the book was called uh, The Blessed Virgin Mary. And in one chapter in that book, um, and I guess they were taking from, you know, John St. John Henry Newman's uh, the dictum, ideas have consequences. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that the primitive doctrine of the Virgin Mary being the second Eve is an idea which, if it's going to remain itself, requires the Immaculate Conception. Now, I don't know if that's stretching the boundaries. But I was curious to know what you would say about that, where her office as the second Eve has bound up within it mm -hmm. the notion of her being, you know, conceived immaculately. Well, I, metaphors are always um, difficult because it, it's hard to know how many of the qualities of Leo the lion I'm supposed to give you. Are you is it because you're so hairy that you're like Leo the lion or is it because you're so brave and you're so courageous? So um, it's difficult to, to say how many of the things are applied to Eve, but I think we can say how many things aren't applied, and that would be fallenness and sinfulness and doing things against God's will and disappointing him and causing chaos in the world. So it seems to me that I've never thought about this before, but it seems to me that you're already on pretty solid ground if you're starting to advance the Eve theory of at least necessitating as a consistent metaphor a sinless from the first moment of her existence mary and if i don't use the kind of western terminology of immaculate conception i think it's just avoiding a terminology which usually has a lot of baggage that comes along with it because 
Um, we think of it in not even 19th century terms. We think of it in blogospheric terms, which are usually claiming that Catholics are somehow Augustinians. Yeah, that, I just uh, I just thought it was interesting how even even Anglican scholars were, were picking up on this. But I, I'm actually done. I could pass this on now to uh, our uh, our good friend William here. All right, William, Father, can you? It is can you hear? a great okay. pleasure having you on here. Uh, are you able to hear me there? Yes. Y'all hear me okay? You're probably you're good. Okay, it's great, great. Uh, Father. Uh, great, great pleasure. Great, great pleasure uh, having you on. Uh, a great, great show so far. Great questions Eric has been presenting and Michael uh, really, really enjoying them. I, I want to hop on over into uh, going back to the, um, we were talking a little bit about the, uh, the enunciation earlier. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just wanted to point out how, um, how interesting it is uh, when we examine the enunciation, we look at the language, uh, particularly in Paul, uh, um, and we can see that at the point of the Annunciation already, as you mentioned earlier, Mary was already uh, in possession of what we would call justice, um, mm -hmm. uh, a term that you've brought forward uh, many times and described in a you know, very in incredible manner. Uh, then we hop a little bit forward to John of Damascus. Uh, despite John of Damascus perhaps not, um, perhaps not in, in, in a particular sense, saying Mary is immaculate and then using Prokathorthesa in the exact same paragraph. Uh, does John of Damascus, uh, does he clearly teach that Mary was immaculately conceived though? What do you, what do you think in regards to John of Damascus? In the um, book chapter, which I had mentioned, which is dedicated uh, to follow here, Damien Kellner, which can be found on Amazon. I have it posted on academia.edu, which is a fairly which is the entire article as well. Um, what you would find is is that um, with uh, um, Damascene, uh, he has two traditions he has to reconcile. One is the originistic tradition, which is always a mixture of uh, fun and really in insightful remarks and then some really interesting, wacky applications of what seemed to be kind of the remnants of Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. So, um, so he's trying to sort through that. And what does he have to sort through? Well, Origen is commenting on Psalm 50 uh, and sin, my mother conceived me in and in iniquities. My mother brought me forth or a rear translation says it. And uh, Origen is going to say that it, this has to do with m male seed, that male seed because of sexual passion conceiving in male uh, with male seed as bringing this passion, this passion is conceiving an iniquity, and this is, in a certain sense, uh, somehow supposed to explain why we have original sin. Now, it's a metaphor. It's talking about infection or passionate uh, coitus leads to somehow a disorganization in our members. Uh, you will find that this is picked up by Basil in his Philokalia. Uh, you'll, this is picked up by Athanasius. This is picked up and I cite all these in my article or chapter, if you will. Uh, this is picked up by um, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, and what else is interesting is Origen's commentaries um, and his ideas on, on these sorts of things is also partially translated into Latin. And Augustine picks up on this. Tertullian has the same idea of the transmission of sin. So in a very broad Latin and Greek speaking sense, we can say that this idea that male seed is the vehicle it is the vehicle of passions of original sin is a north african phenomenon whether latin or greek um, yes. all the early fathers that have this idea they're coming from north africa whether latin or greek and augustine uh, takes up this idea as a latin who also reads greek fathers and he's making this claim that his idea of original sin is both in latin and greek fathers and he, it turns out to be right even if he doesn't get every um, necessarily passage uh, that I'm talking about. So uh, John Damascene then has to deal with this rather vague idea that sperm is uh, ejaculated in the midst of passion and therefore it conveys passion. Is it a metaphor or is it to be taken literally? Is it really an explanatory reason why we have an original sin? Or is it merely meant to uh, be a sort of 
idea that, oh, well, there's passion and disorder in fallen sexual uh, lust, and therefore, in some sense, it's symbolic of something that's happening at a deeper level. Well, in one of his works, which I quote, uh, Damascene solves this question, and he says, look, Sins are about moral actions. Moral actions are in the will. The only thing that sin is spoken of in the literal sense is the will. So clearly, Damascene sees a division. He sees a division between sin in its literal and in its univocal sense is a moral action of a free person. In its metaphorical sense, it's, 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 uh, it's this passionate sperm. So what does he do for Mary's birthday homily? He says, all right, I'm going to deal with all you passionate sperm, you know, junkies out there that are really into this metaphor on Mary's birthday homily. He's like, okay, so Joseph ejaculated. He uses a medical term that's very typical in, in Byzantine medicine. He says, okay, uh, Joachim ejaculated all pure sperm. Well, the all pure part of sperm is nowhere in medical literature. That's John Damascene's way of saying, you know that thing you North Africans are into? You know, the the not literal sense of sin, uh, that sins can somehow be in little uh, homunculi, little pieces of sperm. Well, uh, okay, he had all pure sperm. Now now my problem is solved. Whatever is conceived of a passionless sperm, well, that's in a, that's a, uh, that doesn't have this original sin stuff. But that's not, so he is solving the problem. He's solving the problem in a very unique way, which I've never seen anybody else solve it this way. Uh, it was suggested, actually, at the Council of Basel by Latin fathers that if you could come up with a way to purify, they didn't have access to Damascene sermon, but in the 1400s at the Council of Basel, they had actually suggested if you had a way of purifying uh, Joachim's sperm, you could get an immaculate conception that way. Well, John had already figured it out about 700 years before, and that was his solution. Nobody really got excited about that solution. It was a rhetorical solution. It was uh, against the North Africans. Uh, but he did come up with a solution. Um, I don't think anybody's going to really want to be throwing that around everywhere. But it, it was a nice rhetorical solution. And it looks like we uh, lost. Father, I think we uh, lost yeah. William there while, while he's coming back. Let me ask you a quick follow-up question to what you were discussing there just a moment ago uh, with Eric about development of doctrine. Could you maybe clarify something for me? Is the Immaculate Conception, as far as a dogma, is it a primary or a secondary object of infallibility? Because when I look at the definition itself, it talks about the Immaculate Conception is something that has been revealed by God. Now, I could be mistaken, but that almost sounds like a primary object. And I, I don't know if we, it sounds like we're speaking about development of doctrine, but I, I don't know if that applies to primary objects. So what what would you say is the magisterial status of this dogma? Primary, secondary object? Uh, if we're going to use that kind of language, I mean, it seems to be primary to me now that you've actually focused me on that. I've never uh, actually thought of it in these terms. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with you calling it a primary object. And, and if it's a primary object, in that case, I don't know if it would actually be a development of doctrine, because to me, I thought a development would be something that has a logical or historical connection, a secondary mm -hmm. object of infallibility, of dogmatic fact. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if it's a primary object, which the definition seems to imply that, I, I, I don't even know if we would have to pull the development of doctrine card because but it could be that when he you know when he says this in the definition that he says this is a teaching revealed by god could be that he means indirectly revealed as a mm -hmm. development of doctrine yeah the, the difficulty that you get into is i mean you um you know this is like catholic uh, technical speak but uh the only thing that has per se infallibility in that whole statement is the actual dogmatic formula everything around it maybe magisterial, which means we're bound to try to give it assent of some sort um, mm -hmm. if it's a teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that definitely sounds like a teaching. Um, if, yeah. we, uh, if we have other statements since on the Immaculate Conception, provided they're consistent, then that's the, that's the way we have to approach it. If they're inconsistent, then I guess we pick the one that seems to have the most authority, uh, if it's not a per se compelable teaching. Now, as a primary object object of infallibility, it would be something that was revealed by God or an apostle. So would you say that the Immaculate Conception was actually um, taught by one of the apostles or revealed by God in Scripture? Um, uh, I've never really thought about it in these terms. I mean, my argument would be is it's what 
Roman Catholics like to call the Immaculate Conception, meaning a privation, the privation of grace mm. does not affect Mary at her conception. I don't care about uh, Augustinian traditionism, which was condemned by Anastasius I think, the second, and then condemned again in the 14th century by, I think, Benedict XII. Mm. Well, I don't care about that stuff. Uh, if we're talking about just a privation of a immaterial grace mm. that does not apply to Mary at her conception, um, I would say that the, tradi the, the tradition consistently is going to exploit Luke 135, which is the Annunciation, that declaring her pro uh, already filled with grace before the good news gets to her. Um, so this grace means that she's already justified at the moment of the Annunciation before she gets the message. Uh, I would, though, argue that Galatians 4, again, I think it's 4142, that if you understand what's going on with Mary as one under the law, and, and that whole thing is that you can argue very, very strongly there that Mary had no injustice or else she can't bear a child that can get a Roman legal inheritance. Hmm. Because only uh, the law of the womb, which is being quoted from Roman law there is, babies are only citizens that can actually get a legal inheritance if the womb from which they're born uh, is a citizen mother who is uh, a legitimate wife and all these sorts of things. Uh, and so Mary has a lot of conditions that St. Paul is arguing that she qualifies under to bear the child of promise that no other child uh, was ever born for all the years of the Mosaic law until Jesus. And that metaphor is meant to mean that nobody else had a just mother. No, no other womb was just. No other womb had a just mother that could bear a child that could do what Abraham's children did, which was satisfy God's yeah. demand for justice. So... At any rate, I could go on. I think Excellent. We talk about oh, that, that's great. Um, William, I know you got cut off there, and it looks and like you just got again. cut off again. I don't know what's going on. I think he's having uh, trouble with his connection or camera, one of the two. Uh, but So let me ask another question while we're waiting on him. Um, could you maybe talk about Palamas and Cabasilas? What are their views on the Immaculate Conception or pro Thesa and how, how do they use the term? Well, um, I do have the proof posted on my academia.edu uh, site for my the Oxford Hamburg Book of Mary, where I did on Palamas. Uh, Palamas is pretty representative of the Eastern tradition. Mm -hmm. And Eastern tradition is one where they don't pick. On one hand, you have the universal law of death and the universal law of original sin. And on the other hand, you have Mary, who seems to have so many exceptions that she doesn't fit into the normal mold. And there's a tension there. And even by the introduction to Gregory of Palamas of Augustine's De Trinitate, where there's even some Marian uh, talk there and some sin talk there, August, uh, Palamas is ultimately just very, very peaceful about repeating the tradition, which is, I'm not going to solve this problem of how Mary is all holy in every single way in her nature. And at the same time, there's this universal law of original sin. So he leaves the tension unresolved. Um, we would we would say as systematic theologians, you can't you, you can't hold both at the same time. And Gregory is well, that's a tradition I've got, and I think he's he's telling the truth. The only person I know that that said more than the normal tradition on the actual moment of conception of Mary is um, before that is Damascene, and I shared with you that Damascene came up with a very original solution. And if Palamas wanted that solution, he knew Damascene. I have no doubt he knew the birthday homily, homily of Damascene. He, he just didn't get into the all pure sperm argument. So he, he avoided that and he should have gotten into it because he had read Augustine and he knew uh, some of Augustine's approach to physical infection metaphors. So Damascene would have been the perfect paramedic solution, but he didn't use it. So, and then as far as your second question, which was not uh, Palamas, but uh, Cabasilis. Ah, Cabasilis, uh, I think in the same. I have an article that was put out. I think that the proof is also on academia.edu by Byzantinice Archive. It's a very, very horrible document to read. It's all filled with foreign languages. But um, I, sh I do have a citation there where I show that Cavasilis cited Thomas Aquinas's arguments against the Immaculate Conception, uh, in which Aquinas knew of the word Mary's purification at the Annunciation which the original language of Damascene that he's quoting was pre-purification or purification. And Thomas Aquinas understood, uh, much like modern 
Orthodox since the 16th century uh, do, that the purification at the Annunciation is a purification from sin or concupiscence or some sort of original sin. Um, and Cabasilis is Ahat will have nothing to do with it. So what he does is he takes Aquinas the Tertia Pars, I think around question 27 of the Tertia Pars on the Immaculate Conception. He takes Aquinas's recently introduced arguments. So Aquinas gets introduced by Dominican missionaries into Constantinople. We have an, an attestation by a Nikephoros Xanthopoulos around uh, 1334, 1332, where these Dominican missionaries are bringing up that Mary's sinful. And this is like, this is news to the Byzantines. I mean, there's nothing in their liturgy that says that. Um, certainly the pre-purified has never been taken in that way for the last uh, six, 700 years. Um, so they start discussing the sinfulness of Mary. And what you have is that with uh, Cabasilis's homily, he quotes uh, exactly and strangely, Francis of Mayron, who is a medieval Franciscan theologian who dies in 1328, he quotes his solution, which is Francis of Mayron takes Thomas Aquinas's Tertia Pars question, I think, 27, uh, which notes that Dionysius the Areopagite also talks about purification of angels. And angels don't have sin. How do they get purified? By grace and knowledge. So uh, Aquinas quotes that very thing in question um, 27, I can't, um, I should say, uh, article, uh, I, I, I don't remember the article, it might, might be article three. But at any rate, uh, he, he quotes, uh, Aquinas quotes uh, Dionysius, who acknowledges that there's this all pure, all holy, all positive purification of angels. And so Francis Mayrone around uh, the 13, I think 13, 18 or so, sa says, well, you know what? Aquinas's question already solves the problem. If there's an all pure definition of purification, and it is used in, in, in uh, Dionysius, then all you have to do is take Aquinas's own uh, find, the Dionysius has an all pure definition of, of, of purification, and say, what happened at the Annunciation by Mary getting purified in John Damascene just means that she got grace and knowledge. That's it. And so Francis of Mayron was the first one to rearrange Aquinas's own question in the Summa to argue from Aquinas's own sources for the Immaculate Conception. And we see that Nicholas Cavasilis, who has already been demonstrated this quote at times from uh, the Summa Theologiae in his, uh, I believe it's uh, in his, um, not only his, uh, his Life of Christ, but uh, also selections from Latin works in his um, commentary on the liturgy. I mean, we, we've, the Thomas de Aquinas Byzantinus project, which is a bunch of Greek Orthodox and myself and some other Catholics that, that uncover these sources, but he's already been shown to be very dependent on Latin sources. So it's no surprise that Cavasilis, in order to fight against this Thomist, must have read Francis de Mayron's solution, which was to rearrange Thomas's own question against him as a double-edged sword. And basically Cavasilis defends Mary's all holiness against the Thomists who are apparently now convincing Greek Orthodox to believe what Thomists believe. <laughs> Can I ask you a question right away? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, Father, yeah, that, excellent, incredible points. You, you beat me to it. I was going to ask you about Nicholas Cabasilis. But um, you, you make an incredible point there when talking about Mary. And I agree, for people that, that may wonder, you've got a lot of people that, that, that think, well, the, does Father Coppice believe that uh, there are immaculate conception themes in the Bible. Yes, you do. I know that from dialoguing with you, you, uh, you believe you can find it directly there in Galatians. But another thing that I would like to ask you is, you do have some people that are just very um, insistent. They, they will just say, well, you know what? Uh, I don't care if there's some fathers that teach it in Mary and they have had a completely holy nature. We want, we want the meat and potatoes. We want references to Mary being immaculately conceived. What would you say would be really the earliest? Are there any fathers that talk about an actual immaculate conception? How would he reply to that? Well, um, as you were coming in and out of virtual consciousness, uh, you uh, probably didn't hear us talk about uh, John Damascene. So I'm going to skip that one. Uh, right. But uh, you're kind of setting me up here because uh, William... Uh, has his secret knowledge, which is he's 
he's like this uh, relentless uh, machine that just throws quotes at me all the time, and I can't block him. He finds ways around all my filters. And uh, th he sent me one, though, that was very interesting the other day, which is um, he sent me uh, Romanus, Romanus the Melodist. The Greek. And uh, this quote from Romanus the Melodist, I, I'm very dubious if you're going to find anything before the invention of the conception feast of Mary, which on a on a local level may have been as early as 740s in Byzantium, maybe a little bit earlier. That's the reason why John Damascene and Andrew of Crete begin to mention it. That's the reason why John Damascene, I thought, I formally used to think until about two hours ago, um, I thought that John Damascene had to come up with the solution because of the local feast, which was probably being celebrated of the conception of Anna, the act of conception of St. Anna. But now William throws this horrific quote that solves, in my mind, all blogospheric uh, nightmares. Um, they're just evolved um, from uh, Romanus. So you might as well read it for us because I've already looked at the Greek and I can't figure out any way to deny the fact that it pretty much is the money quote that uh, pretty much any blogospheric orthodox apologist has been taunting Catholics with for, for probably since the since Al Gore invented the internet, so. Yeah, let me go ahead and read it. You're right. Um, really, this kind of puts to rest uh, people that are trying to argue that you can't find this teaching in the early church. Of course, I argue you can directly find it in Father's way beforehand, uh, talking about our completely holy nature. But if you are really just, you say, you know what, I want to hear Immaculate Conception. Well, I'm going to give you a... Uh, a saint venerated even in Eastern Orthodoxy, and we found it, Father Coppice and myself. By oh, the way, you're being too generous. You showed me a quote. I said, I don't trust the English. Go get the Greek to me. You got me the Greek. I said, I can't believe it. You found it. I got it. I went ahead and I got it. I told, I, you know, pretty soon Father Coppice is going to say, you know what, uh, William, I'm going to block your number. I call him so <laughs> much. But we, we have a blast talking about the Immaculate Conception, and we were talking – uh, I, I, I dug up something, and I went ahead, and I couldn't find the Greek online. We got the book, we looked at it, we verified already, it is legit, and Romanus is saying, there's a lot that he says, but the particular area that we really examined was, he says, then the tribes of Israel heard that Anna had conceived the Immaculate One. Everyone then took part in rejoicing. Joachim gave a banquet, and great was a merriment in the garden. Now, you may hear just immaculate there and say, well, you know, some people that that some fathers use that word. It's not talking about what you guys wanted to be talking about. It is. It's talking about an immaculate conception. There's yeah, no the word, the, and, and in fact, the, uh, the the translation is correct because it's being placed in the past. But we use the historical past and the present. So I, I can say something like, so I go to this guy, right? So I go to this guy. It means I went to this guy. Right here, it's Tikti. Tin uh, Achrandon, uh, yeah, I think it's Tikti Tin Achrandon. It's actually literally Tikti Ianat, uh, no, no, Eteken, Eteken, Ana, or I, yeah, I think it must be Iana, uh, Tin Achrandon, which means um, Anna conceived the immaculate female. So there's your money quote. If you check, uh, the reason why nobody's found it until now is everybody was looking for an adjective plus a noun. Immaculate conception. This is a yeah. verb plus an adjective, meaning Anna's active conception, Anna actively conceived an immaculate person. Okay, there's your money quote. Now, is the debate done? Can we go home? You can just <laughs> ignore my book now, because all mine is like, you know, tracking the pre-purified and everything. Essentially, Romanus here is in the most literal terms. If if we were to take this and turn it into the money, the uh, the uh, Latin version, which is conceptio immaculata, it would be technosis, uh, achrandos technosis, which would be uh, immaculate conception. Everybody was looking for something yeah. like uh, silipsis, which is a medical term for conception. Technosis, or here eteken, means to conceive, and then achrandan. Tinachrandon uh, means the female immaculate. So there you have it. Anna conceived the female immaculate. Case, yeah. case closed. 
Yeah, I agree. There's really, there's, there's no way around that one. It, it is very, very explicit. I'm glad I went ahead and I, I got uh, Romanos Greek and we were able, I, I, I look at it as, as a sign from God. I was able to get the book just in time, right before the show. We were able to look at the Greek right before the show. And um, you, you also did incredible in pointing out that Romanos recognizes when he's talking about original sin, he clearly knows what he's talking about here. Uh, you brought out a quote also where he talks about, um, he understands, uh, I think you were talking about biology, right? Uh, forgot exactly. What well, he's, he's using, uh, you know, the Psalm 50 that you didn't hear me talk about. Right. So uh, Origen thinks that Psalm 50, my mother conceived me in sin and iniquity my mother bore me. That's used by Basil. That's used by Cyril of Alexandria. That's used by Tertullian, I'm sorry, not Tertullian, uh, Augustine. Everybody in North Africa thinks that Psalm 50 proves that original sin is passed on in the mother's womb by conception, right? And then we have baptism in, uh, do you have the actual uh, citation I gave you? Because it, it mentions the hymn if people are interested. Um, yeah, uh, I can pull that up. It's yeah, in Roman numerals, so hopefully that's not going to hurt you. Yeah, hymn 21. Hymn 21, it is directly right there. So hymn 21 basically quotes Psalm 50. It says that by baptism and chrismation, one is made clean uh, from the iniquity in their mother's womb and being born in sin. So here you've got Romanus, who has the exact same theory of original sin that we just heard about in Origen. We just heard about in Basil. We just heard about in Athanasius. We just heard about in Cyril of Alexandria, which is all mentioned in my book chapter that it's at the moment of physical conception in utero and that it's in iniquity. Romanus has that same theology. And then he's also saying that Anna conceived an immaculate one, though he has this theology of conception being in an iniquity in one's mother's womb. So it's quite clear that he understands uh, what he's saying here. And he, and he could be, if, if, if he didn't want people to mistake him as saying the Latin so-called immaculate conception, uh, then he should have picked different words because he's quite clearly confused the entire Orthodox Church now. Uh, if, if, if in fact, that's what their position is. Uh, and then secondly, uh, there's another contextual piece here, uh, which is Romanus's understanding of embryology. He believes that at the Annunciation, an embryon, an embryo, that's the word that he uses, uh, an embryon is conceived. So he understands that the embryon that is conceived in its mother's womb is in iniquities and sins and needs to be cleansed in baptism. And yet he thinks that Anna conceived an immaculate person. That's very, very strange. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. That really is incredible. And uh, um, I know uh, in a little bit, we're, I can look, I'm looking at the chat already. I see a bunch of questions. Um, so before we go to the questions, I will let people know in case you all are interested in hearing more about this, uh, uh, hearing more about Galatians, which father, uh, there's these unparalleled in this and uh, commentary in that and what have you. Uh, Father and myself are working on a very important book project that will be out uh, in the future. Uh, we'll have more updates as well. And we'll talk about it more here in Reason and Theology for anybody that wants to look deeper. And then who knows, maybe we'll even talk more about Romanos mm -hmm. in that book. You never know. Uh, Father, if it's okay, could uh, we go to a couple of chat questions? Sure. Looks like Tony P asks, um, have you read Christopher Vinneman uh, in his works? He's an Orthodox scholar. He wrote about Kabbalah and Palamos, saying that both didn't teach the Immaculate Concession. No, I, I actually didn't uh, know about it, that. I wish we had like the ability for me to know when those, those books came out. Um, certainly there's been Orthodox scholars who've said the opposite, so we... Uh, uh, with, not with Palamas, I think, but uh, I have to double check to see if uh, Gillet's article or, or chapter uh, puts Cabasilis in there. Uh, it's pretty standard fare. Uh, Vinyamin wouldn't have been the first to say that. There's a book put out in Greek, in modern Greek, with, uh, a corrected version of Cabasilis' sermons. I got to remember, it's not Trembellus who did it, um, I think it's one of his students. But in there, he has to deal with the same problem, which is it's quite clear that Kabbalah is arguing uh, that Mary is not purified in the sense that these new Orthodox innovator theologians are saying, that she has somehow taint, but that her purification means that she's absolutely holy without any taint. And um, basically, once we realize that he's citing Francis of Mayrone, who himself is reformulating Aquinas' uh, uh, book three question, 
27. This is the reason why the Thomas de Aquino Byzantinus project is so important, which is a project where we're um, publishing all the versions of Thomas Aquinas's works and other scholastics works in critical Greek editions, because we can, we can tell you what these authors are quoting from. If you're just reading texts and you don't know who the author is quoting from, you may take him out of context. But if you actually know who Cavasilis is getting his information from, then you can actually figure out better what Cavasilis is trying to tell us. What Cavasilis is trying to tell us is, I like Francis Mayron. He gave Thomas Aquinas the run for his money on this. Um, looks like Craig truly asks, Father Coppice, have you read every mention of the word pre-purification in the Octicos? Um, I don't remember if I've read the whole Octoikos. Uh, I think I've read about nine mention, nine months of the Menean, maybe ten. Um, I would say this much is that for the Feast of the Annunciation, it's basically John Damascene's version. Uh, to my knowledge, there are there is only one hymn in the Festal Hymns and the Octoikos, which says pro. I'm sorry, pre purified in Greek. I'd love to know if he's found um, in basically the months June, July, no, May, June, July. I haven't read the Menaean for that. So if you find any saints that use pre-purified in, in uh, May, June, July, and I think the last three weeks of the Octo Ecos, I don't know I thoroughly read. So if you find anything in there, I'd, I'd love to hear, hear or see it because I'm trying to collect as much as I can. Aaron asks, um, Father Cops, uh, does the Immaculate Conception still assert that Mary was tempted by sin? If not, why uh, Christ had no sin and was still tempted? Um, I don't know. The Byzantine tradition of Mary's temptation is kind of messy. Um, the time that they talk about her is because Origen talks about Mary's struggle uh, at the cross. And Origen has this idea that Mary had almost if not definitely sinful doubts on the cross when she saw Jesus getting crucified. What you'll see is that Basil picks this up and he has to like clean it up a little bit, but he doesn't do a great job at it. It's still fairly faithful enough to origin where you're kind of uncomfortable with Basil saying, can't you be a little bit nicer to Mary here? And uh, then finally Cyril of Alexandria really cleans it up. And then the rest of the Byzantine tradition is that Mary never had any. Temptation. So you, you will find the tradition of origin of gradually getting purified. Byzantine theologians are very conservative. Um, and you'll also see that John Damas, uh, I'm sorry, John Chrysostom has about two homilies that I'm aware of where he has a very low Mariology. Of course, the Antiochian church denied the title Theotokos in the fourth century, maybe because of Julian the Apostate making fun of Mary's title of Theotokos in reaction to that. Um, and John Chrysostom, coming out of this low Mariology, uh, my friend, uh, Father Philip Roshka, who used to get a doctorate at Notre Dame on John Chrysostom's liturgical year, read all 900 of his sermons. And I said, how many times did you find Theotokos from John Chrysostom's work? And he says, oh, maybe once or twice. So John Chrysostom was not against the Theotokos. He was, the, he was in Constantinople. He never railed against it. But it's simply, he had a very low Mariology that he was starting with, a very low Christology. He did better than Diodore and Theodore, it would appear, uh, uh, fared in later centuries. But uh, it's no surprise to me that he was also struggling with this. So does Mary patristically uh, struggle with, with passions? Somebody like Chrysostom and Origen are going to say that she actually struggled personally with passions, like uh, as a non-all sinless person, uh, uh, sorry, as a, as a sinless or at least a concupiscent a person with concupiscence and uh, the rest of the tradition that I'm aware of Mary is going to be more like Christ all the temptations are external only that means a foreign force is trying to take her passionless person and to in a certain sense tempt her reason or her logical skills but can't actually bring her into a, a situation where she is is filled with bad passions go ahead okay um Craig asks a second question. Is there no exception in the ancient church that the meaning of the term pre-purification pertain to a completely holy and sinless nature, not one who was purified at a later point in time? Um, 
was the question in the early church or to Mary? Uh, ancient church. Oh, yeah. No, pre-purification always means if you're a normal guy that doesn't have a all-holy nature like Mary and Jesus in the dyad, any person that's getting baptized or any prophet needs to be purified from dross, from sin. So, yeah, all over the liturgical tradition, you're going to see when it's applied to us mere mortals uh, and uh, who are post-lapsarian, oh, yeah, we need major pre-purification from moral fault. When it's, when, it's, when it's proposed to Jesus and Mary, it's, it's an equivocal sense. So there are two senses, and they're applied liturgically very consistently. Um, Elijah asks, um, are there fathers that teach that Mary had concupiscence, or fathers that taught that she didn't have it? If so, how do we answer the former who taught the latter? Uh, well, of course, we can't consider origin a father, so mm -hmm. we could say that he doesn't count. But Basil... Basil was struggling with it. He wanted to try to fix it, but you can see that he's still not totally kicking uh, origin to the curb. And then, of course, we have Christendom. So you do have, to my knowledge right now, you have two exceptions. We do learn, though, that the Antiochene school was constantly struggling with a low Mariology because uh, at the latter in 649, the title Immaculate uh, is officially brought into this council and then gets repeated thereafter at, at councils, and it's meant uh, the best ex explanation we have for Mary being called Immaculate, I'm talking about conception. There is no feast to the conception. It's not necessarily being applied to the conception. It's this term that's meant to refer to her as all holy. And uh, in, in latter in 645, 649, it's because there's Christians running around who are probably Nestorian or Antiochian Christians who are saying that Mary has sin during her life. So. That was excluded in Latter in 649. That title gets repeated all throughout the Council in 680. Basically, we're stuck with an all holy Mary in, in Orthodox and post Chalcedonian uh, theology. Uh, if you want to embrace low Antiochian Mariology, I don't even know if, if the, the Eastern, uh, if the Chaldean churches embrace that, that theology. I know that John Meindorf had a famous statement where he kind of held up Chrysostom as saying that, you know, I mean, Chrysostom even had a homily where he said, well, you know, Mary needed to know that she was uh, how she got pregnant. If the angel didn't answer her question, she would have committed suicide. Uh, that's that's more or less the implication. Now, is he using very very exaggerated, typical Christian rhetoric to make a uh, pastoral point? I would argue he is. Uh, do you really want to form a Mariology based off of those kind of sermons? Well, apparently, some people still do. He asked a second question: Did Mary have prelapsarian flesh? Uh, I don't think that from a there is no there is no dogmatic answer on on that until we know what prelapsarian flesh means dogmatically and what we do is we have a bunch of scholastics who are fine on what that means. Did Mary? Maybe it's better to say did Mary have or not have at her conception from a Catholic point of view original justice? And I think that the answer is yes, she had original justice. Uh, or, at, at the very least, if you're going to deny her original justice, since that question, to my knowledge, is not dogmatically answered, that she had sanctifying grace, either of which exempts you from being a child of wrath. So if prelapsarian flesh uh, means did she have definitely original justice, I'm sure that there may be Catholic theologians out there that would admit that she at least had sanctifying grace at the moment of her conception, so maybe that would qualify as post-lapsarian flesh because... Prelapsarian flesh means you had original justice. You have to define your terms here. My own way of looking at it is, um, did Mary have flesh that put her in the category of being like Jesus's human nature instead of our human natures? Yes, that's very interesting. Okay. Um, I see another one here. Let's see. Um, this is by Imperial Reaction. Um, Father, are the Orthodox in the church or outside the church, even if answer is nuanced in but or outside but, what is the bottom line? <clears throat> uh, we give in uh, the Eastern Code of Canon Law, they can serve as godparents to Catholic children. They are, I, I teach all my seminarians this because this is in the Code of Canon Law. Uh, they um, they uh, are able to receive communion without making a profession of faith or orthodoxy is presumed. That being said, there's something that uh, is talked about, which is a communion which is not perfect or not integral. Uh, so how do we look at that? We would say juridically, they are outside of the church, uh, and yet 
Uh, in some sense, they are attached to the church. There's not a really great answer for this. However, we have a real problem, too, if we want to really push them outside of the church because uh, Pope Pius XII also um, canonized as head of the, effectively canonized as head of the um, Congregation of the Eastern Churches when it was had the Pope as its head back in 1943. Uh, the Russian Rite for the Divine Liturgy, which in the Prothesis Rite, names several so-called schismatic saints of the Ortho Russian Orthodox Church that are post Um We have Sergei Radonev, who's been added to the martyrology, as far as I know. Um, so I think it's a, it's a tough question. I, I think the, the Church is perfectly happy with this ambiguity, kind of like the ambiguities that existed during the internal schisms in the first millennium between uh, the jurisdictions of Basil, let's say, and Athanasius, or when you had uh, various saints fighting over jurisdictions like Ignatius and Photius. I mean, both of them are grace-filled, and yet both of them are not, at least temporarily, in communion with one another. I think it's a very sticky question. Go ahead. I don't see any uh, more questions in the chat, but I did have one more. Could you maybe tell us, uh, what was Gennady Scolarius' view of the Immaculate Conception and Procathartesa? Uh, Scolarius never uh, used the term Procathartesa, but neither did Palamas. Palamas just used the uh, more generic purified, which can be used of either Jesus or Mary. Procathartesa is only used of Mary. Uh, some of the Palamites did use Procathartesa, like uh, uh, I think uh, Philothios Kokinos, whom I don't expect everyone to know here, but he's uh, responsible for the modern organization of the uh, ceremonies of the um, of the Divine Liturgy uh, in the uh, Byzantine Rite. Uh, there, the uh, Gennadius himself principally argued his position on the Immaculate Conception uh, based off of his understanding of the general Eastern tendency towards Mary's All Holiness. And then he adapted Aquinas's texts uh, and potentially arranged Aquinas's themes with Franciscan questions in the background. So I knew it's complicated. Well, the reason why it's complicated is like 40 pages of a study that I have in Byzantine Niche Archie. And, um, and in the end, um, you would find that he is not as explicitly into the Procrather Thesa as other Palamites like, um, uh, what is his name? Cat Maso. So. so. Okay. And also, um, one additional question. Would you say that in the Eastern Orthodox view that um, the Immaculate Conception would be considered a um, heresy, or could it be a theological opinion, a theologumenon? Well, um, because the... So one of my one of my very good friends, um, whom I love dearly, is Bishop uh, Kyrillus Katerellis, whom I see all the time in Greece. And... Um, uh, he is, in my opinion, he's one of the best theologians in the Eastern Church. Uh, probably not read a lot because he loves to write in Greek more than other languages, though he can, he's, he's multilingual. But, but at any rate, uh, he's going to insist that the Greek theologians that are representative of his school are going to take the principal effect of the fall, which is death, and that death is the primary way to define original sin and therefore um, original sin uh, because liturgically Mary died and the doctrinal for the Orthodox in the sense that the liturgy cannot be a false worship to God. Uh, so yeah, I think that for them it is a heresy to say that Mary uh, is immaculately conceived because it means that Mary didn't die or she didn't have to die or something like this. So it's attached to death. And basically, uh, we spend most of our time talking about how to read the doctrine of the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception uh, because the dominant view of Martin Gigi, which he really pushed before the definition of the, um, of the Assumption, he wanted everyone to believe that Mary was an immortal being, in other words, that she never physically died. And so a lot of that is kind of all strung up there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with the Orthodox saying, you know, uh, the, you can't believe in the Immaculate Conception because what they mean is you can't believe that Mary lived an immortal life. 
uh, we have to agree on a definition. Do, do, they, do any of them say that Mary had sinful feelings and thoughts, had hatred of God or didn't love Jesus or had moments where she was a bad mother? Uh, I, I, besides the John Meyendorf quote that's taken up probably by the low Mariologies, every, everything official that I've ever seen from any Orthodox will absolutely not attribute anything that is... Um, a, um, a taint to Mary's moral life. What that implies for a Catholic, what that implies for a Catholic, is that she had no privation of graces uh, from her first moral moment. And if you actually listen to Saint Gregory Palamas, her she had moral moments in the womb. So, if you're a faithful Orthodox, Gregory Palamas, you believe that Mary had, like John the Baptist, uh, a moral cognizance or choices in the womb then you're basically saying from the moment that she was in her womb that she had no uh, sinfulness. Uh, and for a Catholic, that means immaculate conception. But we're never going to get this done because we're never going to convince uh, people who need original sin to mean death that it just means a privation of grace. Because we're, we, ha I think, polemically, you got to beat up on us for, for being Augustinians, though Augustine's been condemned twice for institutionism. And until people accept the fact that you can't keep killing this straw man, I mean, there's only so much straw. It's, it's burnt up. It's shriveled up. Catholics, Catholics don't believe in Augustinian uh, doctrines on original sin. In fact, they are rejected. They believe in a privation of grace, uh, which is called original justice at the moment of conception. That's it. So that's where we're stuck. Can you define for our audience transnutrianism? Uh, tra the Traducian doctrine is going to be one where Augustine basically realizes there's all kinds of competing theories of conception in his day. He knows about three major ones. Mm -hmm. And Augustine has to figure out a problem. We all believe in North Africa, I just told you. Uh, Origen believes, Athanasius believes, uh, Basil seems to quote with approval, Origen who believes this, uh, Tertullian believes, Augustine believes that sperm passes on Sin. Well, how do I account for sin in the soul or passions are passed on by sperm? He says, oh, there's this, you know, idea out there that when a man and a woman copulate, they don't, they don't only, they don't only produce the soul, uh, the body, but they produce through a natural process, the soul. And because the dirty body, the passionate filled sperm is in some sense, the producer of the body, that it produces a dirty soul. And so dirty bodies produce, it, it, it's sort of like, I, ha I have to say it since, you know, we all have to talk about it obligatorily now. It's the ancient coronavirus. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the conceptual coronavirus. The, the, the coronavirus that is so powerful that at the moment of conception that it actually infects your soul and you can't get rid of it. And with the, with the craziness that's out there right now, of course, it does seem like it's affecting everyone's souls. So at any rate, um, this is not. This has nothing to do with Catholic doctrine. It was played with. It was toyed with. People tried to make sense of it for centuries, and all the scholastics after Anselm just got rid of it because you can't do anything with it. The only thing you could do is what Damascene did. Sin is a moral choice. So if there is some sort of thing wrong in man, it is that his moral faculty is in some sense not what it once was. What was it not? It was something that once had aids in making its free choices that are no longer there. And those aids are graces, and those graces are gone. And because it has no longer a strengthened will in whatever way to make with ease of passion choices, now it has passionate choices because the will is in some sense not as strong as it once was. So until people get that through their head that this has nothing to do with Augustine, we're just going to be in the same spot. Yeah. Traditional Christian asks about your second doctoral dissertation on St. Gennadius, um, mm -hmm. SCOTUS, and the essence and energies distinction. Is it available for everyone to read? Oh, it's still being corrected. It was like 500 pages. One of my uh, good Greek Orthodox friends, she's she's a trooper. She's going through it and correcting everything. And uh, it's been like three months, and she's still correcting it. And that's, that's pretty much like her full-time job is to correct this dissertation. But it, it will supposedly be produced, it will be published by the Theological School of Calci uh, under the Ecumenical Patriarchate. I was invited to publish it. Sometimes those things don't always work out as they originally were, but God willing, uh, it'll be published. And I, I would like to kind of conclude by saying, 
I'm really emphasizing the fact that I'm totally comfortable with the Orthodox saying that Mary had original sin because they're allowed in their own tradition to equate original sin to death. I'm just saying that that has nothing to do with our doctrine of original sin. And so for us, that makes no sense. There, there were two people who asked this question. This will be the last one. I forget who, the, who is the other one, but I think Craig is repeating the same question. Um, how can John of Damascus believe in the Immaculate Conception when he taught that Mary uh, turn her way from every carnal desire um, and turning away from carnal desires only possible in the post-lapsarian state? I mean, is it a grammatical necessity? She turned away from every carnal desire. Um if she walks in front of naked people, um, could that qualify as a carnal desire? She did not choose to think of those naked people. Uh, she turns away the carnal desire. Are we talking about an intrinsic carnal desire? In other words, Mary is thinking of inappropriate sexual actions. Is that what is that what Craig Julia believes that the Orthodox Church treat, teaches? If you believe that the Orthodox Church teaches that Mary was lusting in her bed at night thinking about men that she would like to be sleeping with position. Um, actually, th there's one more from Samuel, because I think this has come up quite a few times. Does your book cover every usage of pro thesa that exists, or or is there... Um, oh, no. Yeah, no, there's, there's prophets, there's prophets, there are uh, the baptized, um, there's so many, there's so many places that it's, it's just, there's probably... 20 or 30 places that it's used, um, but those are baptismal or other. Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any more. So I know there's, I, I think there was one more question I read here. I, I, yeah. I didn't even get to it. Do you mind if I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Imperial reaction asked, um, what did father caps think about Canon 844.3? Does that mean that, you know, literally the ecumenical patriarch can just halt, waltz into a Catholic parish and receive communion? Or is there some qualification for the separated Eastern churches receiving from our cup? From a, from a canonical point of view, there really is none. In fact, the ecumenical patriarch could walk into the church and do that. And probably the reason why Pope Francis would be sweating to death is because he might be politically savvy enough to know that the patriarch would undermine his own authority by doing that. Um, but technically speaking, I know of no restriction um, on that. There, there have been questions. I'll tell you that the Italian bishops conference had to ask, uh, can we restrict uh, Orthodox who have been divorced and remarried without an annulment? The annulments are offered in the Orthodox church as much as we hear that they're the dumbest things ever. They, I, I know Orthodox who have gotten annulments because they exist in the pedalion but at any rate um if orthodox if orthodox get an uh, if orthodox have not gotten an annulment and they're divorced and remarried can they receive holy communion up until the italian bishops conference only for the regions of italy made the decision that they can't uh they could so obviously there can be restrictions put on it the, the point is is there haven't been restrictions other than this one in italy that i know of that have been put on it um, I think we'll go ahead and end it here. We're at an hour and a half, but Father, I'd love to have you on again uh, to where we can maybe talk about the essence and energies distinction, especially your, your dissertation on this topic. I think that would be a really, really fun show to do. Sure, sure. No, I, I, we could probably try to work something out. And again, um, I, I truly hope that, uh, you know, the, my object in coming on this is just trying to say, let's try to get terms right. The Orthodox have a great tradition. I love that tradition. I from that tradition. Uh, but we have our own tradition of, of saying uh, things. And sometimes people are uh, looking at words and thinking of the raw, the wrong object. But I would say that the, the greatest experience that I had this evening was uh, several minutes before is um, William finding this money quote where you finally now have the words immaculate conception. Uh, the evil words are pretty much down there. Um, I, I don't like saying those words because I think they have too much baggage. But I guess since Romanus has now said them, I guess I can start saying them. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you so much again for coming on, Father. We're going to have you on again. All right. No, no doubt. Father, Father, thank you so much for, for coming on. It was great having you on.
Um, glad we were able to get that quote before you came on. I'm glad Samuel and a few other people did ask that question so it can finally be put to rest. Uh, you've looked at every usage of this term for Mary, even though every usage may not be in your book, you've looked at every usage of Procathardisa. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 should, I should add, though, I should add, I have found a new one for Islam. It's, uh, I've got an upcoming yeah. article that uh, St. John Damascene identified in the Quran, a passage yes. that uh, basically the Quran quotes the homily of uh, St. Sophronius of Jerusalem on Procathardisa, and it exegetes it right, meaning that Mary's all holy and immaculate, without any call oh, yeah. and uh john damascene in his dialogue with the with uh muslims it goes so far as to say you guys mean the exact same thing that we do when you say that so there you have it that'll be a lot of fun we got to talk about that sometime later as well all right again thank you for coming on father everyone thank you for watching please like subscribe share this material on your social media until next time god bless you all